So invariably, when people come to me and they want to differentiate, they're looking huge. They're looking big. They're looking grand. And like that kind of thing often keeps people stuck. So I try to make things as small as possible right away. I don't have them go big because they'll just free. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question, what has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling, the business psychologist, the author of How to Hire the Best, and your co-host on the Profit by Design podcast. Weekly, my co-host, Mike Bruno, and I bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests, who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real-life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. At Tap the Potential, we know that you want to be freed from the constant demands of your business. In order to do that, you need a business that supports your life. The problem is you have a cash-sucking business taking over your life, leaving you frustrated and discouraged. We believe work supports life, not the other way around. We understand you're paying a team and you're still having to do it all. There should be accountability. It shouldn't be this hard, which is why through our proprietary coaching system, we help thousands of business owners just like you have more time for what's important to them and grow profit by 300 to 800%. Here's how we do it. First, take our assessment at tapthepotential.com forward slash assessment. Next, meet with our success team lead to debrief your results. Then join our Better Business, Better Life program. By the end of your first year with us, you will have more time for what matters to you and more money in your bank account than you've ever had before. So take our assessment at tapthepotential.com forward slash assessment so you can stop working so hard for so little return. Take your life back. Profit designers, today Mike and I are bringing you an inspiring conversation with Mark Levy. Mark is the founder of Levy Innovation, LLC, a strategy and differentiation firm. He differentiates companies, brands, thought leaders, political campaigns, TV shows, live shows, products, services, books, and speeches. The ideas Mark and his clients created have been discussed, written about, and used by hundreds of millions of people worldwide. His clients include Simon Sinek, of Start With Why fame, a head of a division of two different White House administrations, a head of the strategy unit of the Harvard Business School, a CEO of Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, and a member of Major League Baseball. He's also consulted to a TV special on the History Channel, as well as to the reboot of the beloved cult series, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Along with his work as a differentiation and positioning consultant, He's a magician. A show he co-created, Chamber Magic, has run in Manhattan for 20 years in more than 5,000 performances and has its own day of celebration by proclamation of the mayor. On TripAdvisor, it's ranked as New York City's number one show, rated higher than even the Pulitzer-winning musical Hamilton. So with that, let's join our conversation with Mark. Profit Designers, At Tap the Potential, we are on a mission right now to be a positive force in social media during trying times for all of us entrepreneurs. In that regard, I would love it if you could help us out. We really want to get behind any of you who are doing good things in your communities, showing up and leading with love. If you are doing something to keep your team together during this time and you're sharing it in social media, or you come across another entrepreneur who is being a gift from their gift in some way that you notice, please use the hashtags lead with love and be a gift. Our team at Tap the Potential is on the lookout in social media for those hashtags, and we will be reposting those social media posts from the Tap the Potential social media. Let's all lead with love, be a gift, and shine bright during these trying times. Do we have any wins and successes to celebrate today? 
We do. It's our 100th episode. We're turning 100. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, it just feels like a couple months ago we were in our 40s, and here we are. <laughs> We turned 100. This is crazy. Goes fast. <laughs> Goes fast. So I'm pretty proud of us because we started recording. We've done an episode a week now, and we're 100, so we're almost into two years recording this podcast. So when we started, we were pretty naive to how this all works, but we were determined we were going to have staying power, and we were going to drop an episode a week. We've done that. <laughs> but, you know, here's what's fascinating to me is I was checking the statistics this morning because I like my statistics. There are a, over a million podcasts in the Apple Podcast directory. Wow. And do you know that fewer than 50% of them have more than 14 episodes? Wow. Yeah. So we're at the long tail. We're going into the long tail. <laughs> <laughs> with the Profit by Design podcast. So I'm really excited about it. Can I ask? Yes, Mark. Yes. What's the most important thing you guys have learned about podcasting in the past 100 episodes? What's something that you didn't expect initially and has become important? For me, I would say the connection with our guests. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Just meeting all the people and just having candid conversations and just, it's really been a really tremendous feeling of a family that we've created. Oh, wow. And you didn't expect that initially? No. No. I thought it was going to be a lot more transactional, you know, just podcast, 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 but we've met some really great people and friends and it's uh, really fantastic. Yeah. I mean, Mark, you're here because Darren Virasamy connected us. He's been our guest multiple times on the Profit by Design podcast. And that's what I think Mike means by family is we have guests, you know, who come back multiple times and we stay connected with our guests. I was going to say, Mike took mine, but the other thing that I really have come to appreciate is the side conversations that I have with people because of the podcast. So I have no idea who's listening. I know people listen. We can see the downloads happening, but I don't know who they are. And then, you know, sometimes people will pull me aside and they'll say, you know, you talked about this on that episode and it really made me think about this. And I've started making these changes in my life or in my business because of what you and your guests and Mike talked about. That part has been really surprising. The other part that's really surprising is how much it is resonating with our audience. We hear, I get phrases said back to me about, you know, work supports life, not the other way around and designing an intention or sustainably profitable business. I hear that coming back a lot. The other one that I hear a lot is breaking even to thrive versus just the breaking even. That concept has been really big with our, our profit designers. Oh, that's, well, and if I may, I know your listenership has gone way, way up in the 100 episodes, and it reminds me of something. So I co-created on TripAdvisor, the highest rated live show in New York City. It's rated higher than Hamilton. It's called Chamber. It's run for 20 years, over 5,000 performances. There's a Chamber Magic Day by proclamation of the mayor of New York City, and it's top rated. So one of the reasons why it is run so long and it's top rated and whatnot, I mean, it's a magic show. Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician, performs it. But it's been reliably going every Friday and Saturday for 20-odd years and so that consistency of, and we know this for a fact, that all the, the cab drivers know it, the concierges at the hotel know it. Like, you don't have to say, gee, I wonder if that little show is running. You know it's running, so they send people there, and their reputations are on the line. They know it's good, and they know it's consistent that it's going to be there. Does that make sense? So Steve, very early on, he said to me, it's our consistency is one of the reasons that makes the show a success. So that statistic you had said about what percent are 14 episodes? or Fewer than 50% have more than 14 episodes. Wow. Right. That just stands out to me. Yes. <laughs> so. And Mike and I were very intentional about that. We attended podcast movement to learn all the things we needed to know. It was a deep dive into learning about podcasting just before we launched the podcast. And that was 
hammered into our heads is consistency. And so there have been times where Mike and I have been on a Saturday morning or a late Friday evening (laughs) recording an episode because we were determined we were not going to miss a week and we were going to make it happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, You know what's cool? We actually did our first podcast episode at Podcast Movement. Yes. Oh, wow. Live. (laughs) Well, we did it over Facebook Live. And Mike Michalowicz was our very first guest. He joined us. He was also there at Podcast Movement. And we recorded in the audio. And this is the other thing about podcasting. Audio quality is really important. So we've put attention there. Even when we have technical difficulties, we strive really hard to put out a good quality audio for the podcast. But at Podcast Movement, we were recording in the it, like a, a big open area with a lot of people milling around back and forth. There was a lot of background noise that had to be edited out and it was quite challenging. So, you know, we just speaking to jumping in, doing something, we just jumped in and did it there to get our feet wet in that kind of environment. And every episode since then has been a heck of a lot easier <laughs> than that first one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Consistency. That's right. So, celebrating a hundred and we're going to just keep going from here with our consistent profit by design podcast episodes every Thursday. Watch for the release. So Mark, we are, Mike and I are honored to have you with us here to celebrate 100 because you're an incredibly inspiring human being with the way that you think, the way that your energy and the way that you really help people differentiate themselves. I think you're a quintessential thought leader and the kind of thought leader that just doesn't just come up with their own ideas, but you are expert at pulling out thought leadership in others and helping them find their unique idea and more than one unique idea. I think we all have more than one unique idea within us. So I think that's something we should dive into here with you. You describe yourself as a differentiation expert, and yet you've said that you wish your job didn't have to exist. Why is that? Oh, sure. So differentiation expert, right? So I help businesses and brands and thought leaders and political campaigns and TV shows and live shows and book speeches. I help them come up with their, what I call their big sexy idea, their unique differentiator. And then I teach them how to talk about it and write about it in a way that would get people excited right? So that people want to seek that idea out. And now they have no option but to go to that person who talked about, because that person symbolizes that idea in the world. And the reason why, like, so that all sounds great. And it is great. It's necessary. But I always say it's unfortunate that it's necessary for this reason. So often people come to me and like, if they're looking for personal differentiation, because I differentiate companies, but also individuals, but if they're coming to me for personal brand differentiation, they often begin the conversation by apologizing for their greatness. They don't put it that way, but they say, Mark, I need to come up with a big, sexy idea, and I'm all over the map. I've done this. I've done that. I was like COO of this. You know, I did this project and this project and whatnot. I'm all over the map. It's really funny to me because I'm sitting there and I'm saying, look, do not apologize for being a fully actualized human being. (laughs) You know, like if Maslow were here, you would be at the top of the pyramid. You'd be the goal that people are striving for. You've accomplished so much in life. And by the way, knowing a lot about a lot of different things and accomplishing a lot of different things like helps you have even more robust solutions in life. So don't pull back on anything. Don't apologize. The problem with differentiation is this, that the concept of differentiation was created in the 19th century to sell soap, right? There were different soaps and soap couldn't speak for itself. So they put in differentiation within the product so the product could stand for a single specific thing. So one soap was 99 and 44, 100% pure. Another one could float. Another one had a blue streak in it. Another one was 20 mule team strong and so forth. Because the soap had to, right? It had to demonstrate a single point of differentiation. But since there are 8 billion people in the world or however many, and we've been told that everyone's their own personal brand. So people come and they've adopted this product-based orientation to their own lives without realizing it. 
products are single dimension. You are multi-dimension. So I say it's unfortunate that we're using something that was not made for human beings. But it is true that differentiation helps get your foot in the door, helps me. But do not confuse your differentiation with the totality of who you are, right? The differentiation is just a way to get people to pay attention to you and get your foot in the door. But you're a lot more than your differentiation. Yes. So what you just said, I'm connecting the dots. We had Jamie Mustard on several, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 episodes back from The Iconist. And what he said that really resonated with me is, you know, our icon is what we throw out there. It's the tip of the arrow that gets the attention. And then everything else can come after that. Mm -hmm. And I really, that's what I heard you saying is as we are differentiating ourselves with our personal brand, we can have that thing that is the, the tip of the arrow that gets the attention. And then we can be the full human being with all of our diverse experience behind that. That's right. And the tip of the arrow, or actually I use an icebreaker ship analogy, but a similar analogy, it's the icebreaker ship or the tip of the arrow. They are not the totality of the thing. They're not what makes every single thing happen. But without them, you couldn't bring in what's important, you know, behind it. Like, so if you think of an icebreaker ship that's cutting through the ice in Antarctica or so, the icebreaker ship doesn't have the doctors on board or the supplies or the food or the medicines or the, you know, the stations and things like that. All that stuff's on ships that are behind them. But if those ships that had all the important stuff led the way, they would break up on the ice and sink. So the icebreaker ship is necessary to break through the ice to get them through the same way your point of differentiation is necessary to break through the marketplace's icy indifference to who you are. Mm. So it's a piece of who you are, but it's not all of who you are. I love that. So if we were going to peel that apart a little bit, and let's say I'm going to work on myself and my human being, right, to differentiate. Wait a minute. You're in construction. You shouldn't peel apart. You build up. That's your whole job. What are you peeling apart for? You know, sometimes you got to peel it back and then you got to rebuild it. Right. Demolition. Right. Exactly. Remodeling, right? Might be an old building. You want a new building. <laughs> so is it equally important to work on both? Am I working on the ice breaking ship? And then all the stuff behind, or is the ice breaking ship who I am and the stuff behind is backing that up? Or Right. No, beautiful thought. So to me, the reason why people come to me is they don't know what that sharp, like the icebreaker ship is. They don't know what it is. So to me, it's essential that we go through everything of theirs. Like, because they don't know where the point of differentiation is going to come from. So I want to know entirely how they get their work done. How, where were they born? You know, like, how did they get to, what are their proud moments in their lives? I mean, these are actual things from the work I do. It's like a homework assignment is, I want you to go off and I want you to like list proud moments. And I want you to come back to me and tell me why they're proud. And many of them should be in the world of work, but they all don't have to be in the world of work. And so they come back to me and they share it. And it's again, great question, Mike. But it's because we don't know where it's coming from. So I look at the totality of their life and their career, and I say, that's the coolest thing there, that single thing. And I don't know where it is I'm going to point ahead of time. And so that I want to elevate to the fore and lead. Is that something of an answer? We work on everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a matter of just because a, a great point. It's so often people come to me. And they're very accomplished, usually, people come to me, and they start to tell me all these, like, prepackaged ideas that they think that they're all about, and that's rarely helpful, because they're working from old paradigms of what they should be looking at. And I'm saying, no, 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 you don't know where you should be looking at. So like, let's stop that stuff. Like the stuff you're telling me about what you think you should be about, that's what's keeping you stuck. So I don't really need to know about it, right? I can read it on your website and all your competitors' websites. I don't really need to know that. Let's go to a new place. This is perfect because on your website, you have two bios. Right. You have the bio that everyone typically requests, and then there's the real bio. 
<laughs> and the real bio is everything that's cool about you and the real story and the, the struggle that's in there. And we will put your real bio in the show notes, by the way. So if anybody is listening, uh, you can go and check out Mark's real bio. When, so you started going in this direction, but I'm really curious. We are big on powerful questions, tap the potential, and using powerful questions to help our clients think outside the box. Because that's the biggest, as a psychologist, I think one of the biggest challenges business owners and entrepreneurs face is we get very narrowly focused on the problems in front of us. And that's where our focus is and what we focus on grows and we forget to look all around us and see that there's opportunities and possibilities. And if we're, we're stuck in a room and it's a dark room and we can't find an exit and then we're only looking in one direction, we miss that there's a window, there's a door, there's a crack over here, there's a loose brick we could push to get out. There's lots of ways out of that room and questioning helps get us out of that box. I would love to hear some more of the, the questions that you ask when you're helping someone differentiate with their personal brand. Oh, I'd love to tell you very quickly, though, based on you said something super interesting about my two bios, which I appreciate. So I'll answer the question, but about my two bios. So that was something I had not seen people do before. And the reason why I did it is that I had all kinds of information I wanted to share, but I didn't want to let the standard format push me around. Ooh. Like I decided what was going to be there. So like, this is a very big thing to me because again, people will come to me and they'll say, oh, I can't do something. And I'll say, why can't you do it? And it's for reason X. And I'll say... That's just because of the existing format. Don't let the format push you around. I'll give you a perfect example of this. I was working with a big internet marketing guy, a guy with like enormous reach, you know, millions of people. And there, he was writing a book proposal. And I said, how many people can you reach? And he said, 1.4 million people. And I said, okay, great. I want you to open the proposal with that. You know, I want that to open the, because the publisher is going to love that. And so he said, okay, he wrote the proposal. And when he sent it to me, I started to read the opening of the proposal, the overview. And he was talking, talking, talking. It wasn't on the first page. It wasn't on the second page. It wasn't on the third page. And I called him and I said, I told you to open with the fact that you can reach 1.4 million people with your internet presence. And he said, I did open with it. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, turn to page 35. There's the marketing plan. It's in the first paragraph of the marketing plan because he looked at it as marketing knowledge. And I said, no, I'm saying you need to say it in the first or second paragraph of the entire proposal and you can repeat it again later on. But he was letting what he construed to be the format like dictate to him. And I said, no, no, it's whatever's most important that you co-opt the format in order to make it happen. If anyone gets a chance, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, it's going to be on your site, right? Levy Innovation, my company, Levy Innovation. You'll see that there was all kinds of information that I wanted to get in there that I thought was important. And I just like created ways to get it in there a very quick, and this is should meaningful to the work that everyone's doing out there. So for instance, me as a speaker, I do, I do public speaking and there were, I spoke at Google. So I wanted to make sure people knew I had spoken at Google and also Vistage, right? Vistage Worldwide, the 22,000 member peer-to-peer -peer CEO organization named me one of its top 10 new speakers. So I wanted to highlight those things. But when I originally wrote the speaking part of my bio, it was all mushed together. So you would have lost Google. You would have, even if I had opened with Google, it was this huge piece of text that you wouldn't have wanted to read. So if you go to my LinkedIn profile there, you'll see, I said to myself, so what is Google? It's a company or it's an organization. And so what are these other things? These are conferences and one is Vistage. Anyway, when you go to my profile, you'll see how I broke it up. So all of those things stand out on their own. So they all hammer home. 
I didn't let the stated format push me around is a way. So whatever it is you're doing out there, like if you have to send someone a proposal, if you're at, it's marketing, it's advertising. If you have something important to say, you have to find a way to feature it, even if it means that you have to do things in kind of a different way. Absolutely. Psychologically speaking, it's brilliant. Because when we fit inside the form, it's very easy for the brain not to pay attention, right? Oh, right. Because it's just doing what is expected and the person receiving the information just files it in a box. And so when we are outside that box, when we break the form and we do something different, then we're standing out. We're getting attention. Right. Beautiful. Thank you for that. So you would ask about what questions I ask to help differentiate people. First, I want to ask questions that will wake them up that, you know, that they can't go on autopilot for. And so the first question that I'm going to tell you I'm asking him sounds like an autopilot question, but it's so odd that invariably, like I see people like sit up when I ask it saying, what? It's like so strange. So invariably, when people come to me and they want to differentiate, they're looking huge. They're looking big. They're looking grand. And like that kind of thing often keeps people stuck. So I try to make things as small as possible right away. I don't have them go big because they'll just freeze. Mm. So one of the first questions I invariably ask people is if they have a hard time talking about what they do, I say, tell me about your business. Like, just tell me about what's obvious. Like, as a matter of fact, it's so obvious that it's almost stupid. You almost feel silly telling me about it. And this obvious question is, I mean, you know, Sabrina, you'll back me. I think this is straight out of like Fritz Perls. I think this is straight out of, you know, it's this idea of, Obvious means it doesn't mean tell me what you do. It means tell me what you do in such a fundamental way that it's almost embarrassing to tell me about it. So invariably, when they start to tell me about what's obvious about their business, oh, about how you find customers, like what's obvious about it, like you feel stupid even telling me, oh, how you do the work, like what is it, you tell me what's obvious invariably their resistance lowers to such a degree because the question's so stupid that I asked. It happens like clockwork. They'll be talking, 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 and they go, wait a minute. I never thought about this, but, and often we will come up with a very important idea from going what's obvious, but you kind of need to let the water run Mm. because the initial water will be rusty So they'll start to talk. And so that's one question, what's obvious? The opposite question I invariably ask is, so tell me about your business. Like, what's surprising about your business? Like, what is something noticed today when you guys were talking about the podcast? What was my first question? I said, so what was something that you didn't expect to happen? What was something surprising from the first episode to now that you just didn't expect? Mm -hmm. Right? That would be the kind of thing. Like, what are all the ways that this thing has surprised you? And in particular, like, sometimes I'll focus that question, what do prospects find surprising about what it is you tell them? Or what do clients find surprising about what it is once they've worked with you, when they start working with you, that they didn't expect this to happen? What's something surprising that you've encountered in doing the work yourself, right? So there's different viewers of it. And so I'm interested in what all the surprises are from all of them. Mm -hmm. Those are great questions. And I really appreciate the fact that you have to throw what is, seems like a softball question. Tell me what's obvious, but it does. It's like the water and the rusty pipes. You just kind of let people start talking. And that as a psychologist, that is my experience too. Usually the first things we say out of our mouth is just, you know, kind of surface level stuff. And the longer we talk, the more we can kind of peel back the layers of the onion and get to what's really good underneath that. That's right. Because if people just stay with what's important or what they construe to be important, it's almost like they sometimes stay with stuff out of obligation that they're bored with, even when it's important and they don't get to anything good. It reminds me of what the poet, I think he died in 1980, the Seattle poet Richard Hugo said, here's the problem beginning poets have. They decide they want to write a poem called Autumn Rain. 
And then they put down three lines about autumn rain, and then they run out of things to say about autumn rain. But since the poem is called Autumn Rain, they continue to write like awful stuff about autumn rain. And he said, but you don't really know what the poem's about. So the moment that you run out of interesting things to say about autumn rain, you should jump to another subject. Because, you know, like you're going to bore yourself, you're going to bore the reader, you jump to another subject. So like to me, it's the same thing. People come to me and they'll initially just be talking about like thoughts out of obligation. It's like, oh, I'm in business, so I have to speak about those things. No, speaking about those things is what's keeping you stuck. Mm -hmm. So other questions that I ask related to it. So for instance, I'll often go to, I'll ask people questions about things that aren't working. But again, I try to ask those questions from different dimensions. So I'll ask them things like, and this is about innovation too and creativity. I know that's a, this is a very big part of the work that you two guys do. So I'll say, I ask these questions during brainstorms. I led brainstorms with Mad Men, you know, on Madison Avenue. So it's things like, what is it that we can do? What can we do with this product that's really, really boring? Like, that's something I'll ask. And after we speak about that, I'll say, what can we do with this project that's really dangerous? Like, but I mean physically dangerous. Like, what could happen in the campaign? How could we launch a campaign to promote the product that would be physically dangerous? Now, I just want to say, this is for thought starters. Don't really do anything like this. <laughs> but it's the idea. And okay, what's something that we would do that would get us sued? Again. I'm not advising this. I'm just, this is thought starter stuff, right? But it's not just what's bad in what to do. It's what are all the different versions of bad? Because from one of those versions of bad, something really cool that's not bad. You can jump from that thought. You don't want to do the bad thought. You don't want to do the thought that's dangerous or that's going to get you sued or anything. But it's like, wait a minute, if we do that, What's the opposite of that? And so again, it frees them up. If they're only thinking about bad stuff, they're relaxed. The same way, by the way, I'll open brainstorms. I will often have people, I'll say, it's the idea of if we knew what the solution was, we wouldn't start with this brainstorm meeting. So let's take solutions off the table right away, right? Like forget solutions. We don't want solutions. I want us to open up by brainstorming every possible question that we have about what it is we're doing like questions about the product, questions about the service, questions about our capability, big questions about society, small questions about like whatever, questions about our budget, questions about, and I tell them, I say, we're not going to have to answer any one of these questions. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to write them down. If you hear a question or two that you think you want to answer later on, write it down on a pad, but I'm not going to do it. And we're not going to spend time answering them. But the reason why I do that is because I find often with parts of a problem, there are parts of a problem that people don't want to face mm -hmm. because they don't really believe that they can solve for it. So they kind of like act like an ostrich. They put their head in the ground. They don't want to look at it because it, where they would come face to face with, with like their ineptitude or like something that they can't solve for. So they ignore it. But if they know that they only have to ask questions and we're not even going to address them, it frees them up to look at the entire situation and it creates this excitement and freedom in the beginning, right? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So much of what you're saying is resonating with me. I don't know if you've ever heard the, the phrase Q storming. Oh, sure. Okay. So that's what you, you described. We do this at Breakthroughs on the Bayou at the retreat. We have someone come into the love seat and then the rest of the you know participants in that little grouping will brainstorm questions around the issue. And sometimes we don't even go into problem solving. It is just a question brainstorm. And I've never had anybody capture it exactly the way you said it, but you said there are parts of a problem we don't want to face. 
And that's what that cue storming gets to. And it, cre- it makes, because we don't have to answer the question, we are free to go there. That's right. That's exactly right. Right? In our thinking. And so we quit avoiding it. This is how my book, How to Hire the Best, came to be written. It was because I had interviewed my top clients and they were all coming to one challenge that they wished I would solve for them. And that was the hiring problem, how you hire great employees in small business. And I was seeing, I write about this in the next How to Hire the Best Entrepreneurs Edition. It's in the introduction. I was looking at these interviews and all these responses and I was seeing what they were telling me and I did not want to see it. I did not want to see that they wanted me to solve their hiring challenge because I had no solution. (laughs) None. One morning, it just came to me that what if I could find small business owners who have had success hiring great people and I could just go ask them questions, right? I didn't have to solve the problem. I could just go ask questions and maybe I could learn something from them at that point. And it freed me up. And that's how the whole series came to be written. And I developed a solution that wasn't there, but I did not want to face that problem. So that what you just shared just totally landed. Well, I thank you. So what it is that we're all saying here, it's like when you come up to a barrier that you can't navigate, it's like people come to me, they want a big idea. So invariably, I have them go obvious or small. You know, they come wanting a solution. So it's like, let's ask a question. They want something exciting. So what's boring? Like, let's look at that. It's always, I won't say always, because I do ask of people to think big and to think exciting and whatnot. I do, but rarely in the beginning, because that's the thing that's keeping them stuck. That's where they're having resistance. They're trying to think of the right answer before they think of all the answers. They try to think of good answers, you know what I mean? And it just creates too much tension in them. And human beings, you know, like we're not precision instruments. You know, we're human beings. You know, we're not, you know, we don't do things with like some kind of like logical accuracy. There's all kinds of ideas and stories that are filed away in us that are in us but we don't know where they're filed. So if you just use the, if you approach the filing cabinet in the same way over and over again, and you keep on opening the same drawers, it's like, oh, client development. And if you keep on looking in the C drawer and the D drawer for client development, there's nothing there. And you do that for years. It's like, no, maybe you put it under Z for some reason or M or whatnot. So that's what it is that we're doing. Wow. Yeah, I, I really like the the idea of, you know, when, a lot of times when people are trying to find those solutions or those big ideas, it's almost like there's a certain amount of aggression towards, I need this idea, I need to get it done, right? But what you laid out and what you talked about, about the thought starters and really breaking it down to a much smaller, less obvious question, you could become vulnerable, right? A little bit more vulnerable and there's less aggression and anxiety to, I need this done right now. And now it's a completely different approach. I really love that whole thought starter. That's awesome. Like, let's look in a different direction. And what you guys had said, uh, the two of you, Sabrina, you had made a similar point earlier. I forgot how, but Mike, what you just mentioned, it also reminded me of the idea approaching a problem Mm -hmm. or a goal in small steps. You know, like this idea, I mean, you guys know this much better than me, but I remember reading in a book about like the small step approach to problem solving where a woman couldn't make herself exercise and she had a treadmill. So like the therapist just told her to stand on the treadmill while she was watching TV. In other words, don't turn it on, stand on it for like a minute and then just get off. And that was the first week. But after a while, when you approach things in such small incremental ways. I remember years ago, I think I must have gotten a computer sent to me from Dell. Like this was like, right? I've used Macs for 25 years. So this was a long time ago. But like Dell must have sent me a computer and I was really nervous about putting it together. So I had the boxes in my office for like 10 days and I hadn't touched them. And I finally said, you know what? I'm just going to unpackage them and lay them at the parts out on the floor and I'll put them together maybe next week. But when I started to unpackage thing and, and lay them out on the floor, I just said, 
oh, you know, well, since I laid them out on the floor, I can tell this one fits into that one. So I'm just going to do that. Long story short, like 90 minutes later, I put the computer together. But it was because I was just unpacking the computer. I wasn't trying to put the computer together. It's the permission to take the small steps. And one of my quotes that I have that I say over and over is small steps taken in a consistent direction lead to big results in a pretty short period of time. And, you know, just look at us. Here we are 100 episodes in. We've taken a lot of small steps in a consistent direction and we've gotten big results from it in a short period of time. And it's that permission to, we can just do the smallest thing. It's easy. It's doable. We don't have to do the whole elephant. When we have people who want to write books, we have clients that tap the potential who take their four week vacations and use their time off because they're finally getting around to being away from their business and having enough mental space to write that book that they've been thinking about for years. And it feels daunting. Like now I've got time and I've got to sit down and I've got to write all the time. That's just, it's too big. So start small. What is one idea that you could spend some time on? I had one client yesterday say, I'm just going to write a thousand words a day. I'm just, that's all I've got to do is sit down every day for an hour, get a thousand words out. And she's just chunked it down to one thing. Well, and related the two of you, because this idea of the smallest unit possible, so Mike is in construction, right? So I was thinking, well, in order to build a house, you have to put down the first brick. But now to join in with what Sabrina just said, it reminds me the great novelist E.L. Doctorow. So Doctorow's been dead a few years, but Doctorow, um, he had writer's block. And so he li- I think he lived in Yonkers. And he had writer's block and he just couldn't think of what to write for his next novel. And he just like started looking out at his house and at the street. And he realized he was staring at his street and at a specific brick in his house, like on the wall, you know, it was part of the wall. And he started to think, oh, this brick and this street and whatnot, like they're all from 1905. I'm making up the specifics. I don't remember the exact time. But like from looking at that brick, he started to write the history of that brick. And that became the huge bestseller from the 70s, Ragtime, which became the movie with James Cagney and people like that. But it was all from looking at a brick. He was stuck. He couldn't do it. So it's like, screw it. This brick. Okay, I'm just going to write about this brick. And the brick became like this enormous bestselling book. Right. So interesting based on what it is you said. So if going big is not helping you go small is what it is. You know, that poet that I had talked to about before, Richard Hugo, the Seattle poet who talked about autumn rain, he had also said something. He said, you should write about small things because if you have a big mind, it will show itself while you're writing about small things. That is profound. Yeah. Oh, amazing guy. So the other part that I know about you is that you have a background as a magician. Yes. I would love to hear more about how that influences your work. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. So I've loved magic since I was four years old. And so over the years, I've created a lot of magic tricks and even magic shows. I said at the beginning, right, I co-created on TripAdvisor, the highest rated live show in New York City, and it's a magic show. And so when you're a magician, what you need to do is in order to create something miraculous. So one is you usually don't go for subtle, how should I put it, like the effects that you do, the magic tricks you do, you want to freak people out. You want people going, no, freaking what, you know, you want them screaming or so. So you're going for some huge freak out reaction in other people. You want to like fry them. And so in doing the work with people, I'm actually going to fry. Like that's what it is that I think about in coming up with the differentiations or so. I don't often say that to my clients because I don't want to scare them, but I'm thinking about like what's going to fry people's minds when they hear it, when they go, oh my God, like that, right? So that's a design parameter. But another thing is magicians, in order to fry people's minds, what we need to work with 
needs to be understandable and almost ordinary to the audience. So if you come out with, and I forget who said this, a magician, I think his name's Mike Caveney, I'm not sure, but he said something like, if you come out with a box, a lacquered box with all kinds of dragon stencils on it and whatnot, like a wooden box, the type that no one's ever seen before, and you open it and you show it's empty and you close it, and now fire and streamers and confetti and whatnot pop out of the box, the public, the audience will say, oh, you know, like great box, not great magician, great box. Like, I guess that box, like those are properties of that box. It spews fire and confetti and streamers. I'm not familiar with that box. So I guess that's something that that box does. If I knew about those, but does that make sense? So it's because the box is strange. So that's why magicians often start out like with a piece of thread or a deck of cards or they borrow a coin or they ask people to think of something. It's got to be where people are already. And so a problem that people, sometimes people come up with a big idea and they'll come to me and they'll ask me about it and they'll say that they're not getting traction from it. And I'll say, how are you talking to the public about it? And they'll talk to me about it and I'll say, you're starting from this new strange place, right? You're not starting, you're telling them about your innovation, but that's not in their universe yet. So you're sharing with them something that they can't comprehend. So you just look like an idiot to them. (laughs) I had this very experience a few months back. I was at a networking event and one of my colleagues introduced me to a couple of his colleagues and he says, she's an author. And then he left. And of course the other two guys asked me, so what do you write about? And I said, how to help business owners take a four week vacation. And they just, (laughs) that was so far out of their universe of what's possible. They had the deer in the head like that. It was really hard to recover the conversation after that. And I'm a pretty good conversationalist, so you're spot on. Well, thank you. What I would say in, I don't know that much about your forthcoming book, but I do know something. What I would probably say is, um, just off the top of my head, it's something about like, I'm writing a book, um, people think, like owners of businesses think of taking time off as something that hurts their business, like, you know, getting away from the business. What I do is I teach them how to use their time off as a way to make the business even more productive and profitable than when they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, and if people go, oh my God, how do you do that? Then I would kind of go in, well, here's how most people look at their business. So I would first talk about what the accepted ideas are. But I'll say, but again, the way I approach it is so much different. And then I would talk about using this long, long vacation. By the way, I've never taken a four-week vacation in my life, ever. I'm 57 years old. I know that's bad. I highly recommend it. Right. I need to read your book. (laughs) So entrepreneurs everywhere will be working on their four-week vacation. That's right. But it's this idea that taking time off is a driver of further client development and excellence and increased market share that you have to, you know, it's this old paradigm of the more time you put in, the better the business will be. But that's because you're putting time in just doing certain tactical, repetitive things that are stuck within a certain way of being. And to be able to take this long vacation requires you to think and do things very, very differently. It seems like a joke to say, like, you in the normal way that you're operating, if you took time and away, time away from your business, yeah, it would probably do bad. But that's because you're being the same person who you are right now. You need to be different in order to have a business that thrives without you. Forgive me for telling you what I'm just like riffing on. That is so spot on because we really do have to be a different kind of leader to have a business that gives us our life back. And it's, it's the shift in the thinking and the commonality. It, just like you said, it's starting the conversation where they are. And I think about, you know, our profit designers who are listening to this, thinking about their businesses as they start describing what they do. What I get intrigued by is, 
you know, when we have to do those elevator speeches and we hate elevators, all of us, like we cringe, like, oh, I'm going to do an elevator speech. You know, we start with just kind of the obvious of what we do and then people put us in the box and then they stop listening and the conversation again goes nowhere. And if we go too far out of the box, then like I just shared that experience, the conversation goes nowhere. So Let's kind of look at, you know, the elevator speech, because I know you're really good at supporting people in their elevator speeches too. So most people find that to be just torture to write their elevator speech. And you tell people they need dozens of different elevator speeches. So why dozens? And Right. This thing is torture to do one. And I say, right, not only do you need one, but you need like 30. And so they look at me like I'm insane. And right. So the idea there, by the way, when I'm at a a mixer, of course, I haven't been at one for a while, right? With the situation, the world. But when I'm at a business meeting or a mixer or something where people don't know me, I am so confident about my elevator speech and also the stuff that I create for the client that at times, sometimes people will say, I promise you this happens all the time. They'll say, oh, so Mark, what do you do for a living? Because I listen to what it is they did. They said, what do you do for a living? And I often laugh before I say it. I have to stifle a laugh. And I say, I apologize for laughing. I'm not laughing at you. And I say, and it's because when I tell you what I do for a living, you are going to be really excited. And I'm just laughing because I'm thinking ahead a few seconds. So I apologize. And so imagine they go like this. It's like, okay. And right. So not only should you not be scared of an elevator speech, but you should be so excited to deliver it that you're almost giddy. So by the way, I have different elevator speeches. You've already heard some of them. So one elevator speech, depending on the audience, is consultants and other thought leaders hire me to increase their fee by up to 2,000%. So I do that and people go, oh my God, how do you do? Or another time I'll just say, I'm a differentiation expert. I differentiate businesses and brands and thought leaders and live shows, you know, so blah, blah, blah. I have all kinds of different things, all kinds of different formats that I teach people. So the thing about elevator speeches is this idea of people are asking of the elevator speech format too much. That's why it's keeping them stuck. They want to get the totality of their being and the greatness of everything they do into a single elevator speech. And that's what's making it hard to write. And frankly, the elevator speeches I hear are horrible. Like, you know, like they're, it's like, I get it why you don't want to do this because you just bored, you know, like me to death in 15 seconds. You know, it's what it is, is instead of trying too much, You need to have multiple elevator speeches for your business, like one of seven seconds, one of 30 seconds, one of two minutes. I'm making these times up. You don't have to like look at it and say, oh my God, this one's eight seconds. It's wrong. But I mean a super short one, a longer one. And so you need to have it about your business. You need to have the different elevator speeches for each one of your products. You need to have different elevator speeches for each one of your services. You need different ele- size, different elevator speeches for your books and so forth. And when you're writing about something that's so specific, it makes it easy. Mm-hmm. Like just give you an example. So I did a 10 part video series for O'Reilly Media and Barrett Kohler. I mean, this is an elevator speech. It's called Influencing People Honestly, Ethical Persuasion Strategies for Leaders, Managers, and Entrepreneurs. It teaches you influence strategies that are so fair that you could share them with the person you were trying to persuade as you were trying to persuade them, and they would applaud you for it. And it's because these are influence strategies that are not about distortion and misinformation and boxing people into a corner. These are strategies about helping the other person make a wise decision for them and helping them sample the thing you're trying to persuade them of itself so they can see how it fits into their life. So you're helping them, you know, anyway, like that kind. So it was very easy for me to write a speech like that because all I was doing was describing a single product that I was doing. I wasn't trying to put my entire soul on the line. So if someone says no to that, they're just saying no to one of my products. 
They're not trying to, does that make sense? This idea of, we talked about the idea of people categorize me, I think is the word you used, Sabrina, like a few seconds ago when you're giving an elevator speech. So people want to categorize you. They want to put you in a box. They want to understand who you are right away. And you want to let them. Because if they don't put you in a box right away, they're going to be nervous speaking about you because they don't know who or what you are. So they get really nervous. So what I teach people to do, this is another one of my elevator speech formats, is I teach them to put themselves in a box but then to describe how the box that they're in is different from all other boxes. So for instance, one of my clients, Victor Huang. So Victor, if you uh, met him, Victor, here's his box. He'll say, I'm an economic growth expert. So what I do is I help communities, towns, states, even entire countries to grow and prosper economically. But the way I do that is really different. See, the way most places, most cities and towns try to grow is they use what I call the Goliath approach. That is, they try to grow by bringing in some big giant player, like they try to get an Amazon, uh, an Amazon home office or something, or like some big giant place that's going to infuse lots of jobs and lots of money into the community. Well, that never works because blah, 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 I won't go into all the things. Well, he talks about that doesn't work for these reasons. And as a matter of fact, it's even worse than you could imagine. Because now if you have a giant player there, if they decide to leave, now all the infrastructure of the town was created for them. Now it's kind of ripping the heart out of the town and the town becomes a ghost town. What I do is much, much different. I teach companies or countries how to grow economically. And I won't go into that whole thing. But it's a bottoms-up approach, an entrepreneurial approach, one entrepreneur at a time becomes it. But does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're taking the information and you're leading with the information that would get them to understand. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm an economic growth expert. I help communities and cities and states and even entire countries grow economically and prosper. So they get it. But now it's like, but the way I do it is really different. And here's how the standard is. And here's how I do it. Yeah. Mike, I don't know about you, but I feel like my thinking has been stretched today with Mark here and just all the wonderful questions and your way at coming at situations. And it's really great for differentiating and innovating. Mark, as people are curious about you and want to learn more, what's the best place for them to find you and learn more about you? Well, they can go to my website, levyinnovation.com. That's L-E-V-Y innovation.com. They could also go to my LinkedIn page, which again is under Levy Innovation if you go to LinkedIn. And also I've written some books if they wanted to find those. My favorite book of the books I've written is a book called Accidental Genius, Using Writing to Generate Your Best Ideas, Insight, and Content. So that's a book about how to use a freestyle form of private journaling to solve your dearest business problems. So I love that book. I think that will be of definite interest to our profit designers. Mike, I'm real curious. What are your takeaways from this conversation? My big one for sure is the thought starters. I love that. I'm actually going to print that out, slap it on my office wall, and just keep that in the back of my mind and just dig really deep for just different questions. Yeah. You know, just, I really love that process. Just sounds awesome. By the way, related to that, thank you for that. If you go to my website, on my website, one of the first things you'll see, at least now I'm changing my website, but I, right now it's there in the very beginning. I have a free ebook called List Making as a Tool of Thought Leadership. It teaches you how to take the topic that you want to develop a business around or differentiation around or write a book around or whatever it is. And then it teaches you how to make five or 10 or 12 different lists about that topic that each look at the topic from an entirely different direction. Like what's the best advice I know about this topic? What's the worst advice I know about this topic? What stories come to mind when I think about this topic? You know, what images come to mind when it teaches you how to look at it from, and you just make these lists and you just print the lists out and you look from item to item and list to list. And human beings were natural meaning making machines. We can't help but make meaning. Like that's what we do without even being asked. And so you start seeing new ideas and stories and connections 
because you got the ideas out of your head, right? And it gives you, so that's what it reminds me. So that list making is a tool of thought leadership is something you'd want to take away. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely going to uh, definitely download that. Mark, I want to thank you again for joining us on our 100th episode. It's been awesome. I appreciate all your thoughts and you spending time with us. Oh, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Rena, you have anything else before we wrap up? I just want to share my takeaway, Mike. We need to do some brainstorming about what we can do on the Profit by Design podcast that's dangerous and that will get us sued. <laughs> <laughs> but don't do those things. Do not do them. Do them, but we're going to brainstorm because you know, we've got to come up with you know how to differentiate. We've got a hundred other episodes or so to do and go here. So. I want to be back for episode 200, my friends. Absolutely. And you'll find out what's <laughs> happened from our, all of our creative brainstorming that you've started for us. Thank you again, Mark. It was a pleasure having you with us. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. If you're like most business owners, you have a cash-sucking business that's taking over your life. After the first year in our Better Business, Better Life program at Tap the Potential, you'll have more time for what matters to you and more money in your bank account than you've ever had. Get started. Take our assessment at tapthepotential.com forward slash assessment. Thank you for spending time with us today. Join our conversation in the Profit by Design podcast Facebook group. Share your thoughts on today's episode, ask us questions, and let us know what you want to hear about next. Visit our website at ProfitByDesignPodcast.com to access resources from our sponsors and tools we've created for you. Subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening to right now. There's a subscribe button right there. Go ahead and hit it so that you always get a notification when we release a new episode. And finally, Share our podcast with a friend if you know a friend who would enjoy it. Thanks again for listening. This is Real Life Business. Keep your chin up. Keep moving forward. You got this.